You are listening to the IFH Podcast Network. For more amazing filmmaking and screenwriting podcasts, just go to ifhpodcastnetwork.com. Joining me today is Sean Coyne. Sean has been a publisher for 25 years. He is also the co-founder of Black Irish Books, and he is working on a new project right now called The Story Grid. Sean, how are you today, sir? I'm doing great, Dave. Thanks for having me on. Oh, thanks for coming on. Uh, So, Sean, could you give us a little bit about your background? Sure. Well, let's see. I've been in book publishing since... What the, the uh, early 1990s, and um, I've been everywhere from the major publishing houses where I worked as a as an editor, uh, acquiring and editing books for about 15 years. Um, I was at Dell Publishing, St. Martin's Press, Doubleday Publishing, and then in the year 2000. I started a, a new publishing company probably about 10 years too soon uh, called Rugged Land Books, and it was an independent company that um, I had for about seven years. And some of the titles we published there were uh, The War of Art by Stephen Pressfield, um, a big bestseller by Brett Favre, um, a number of um, projects with the National Football League. And um, it was a wonderful time, but it was also extremely stressful because this was before the era of, you know, the Internet and um, self-publishing and all the revolutions that have happened over the last, I'd say, 10, 10 years, probably even shorter than that. Probably, it's probably been only a, since 2007 when the Kindle came out that things have really gone crazy. So um, anyway, after Rugged Land Books uh, shuttered, I uh, worked for a literary agency, which was part of a major Hollywood um, agency called the Endeavor Agency for a couple of years. And um, when Endeavor merged with William Morris, uh, I decided to start my own agency. uh, And that was around 2009. And that's called Genre Management Incorporated. And one of my first clients uh, was Stephen Pressfield, who I've known since 1995. Um, I've edited pretty much everything that Steve has written, with the exception of about three or four projects. Um, And I also represent David Mamet for his work uh, with with books, Uh, Robert McKee, the the very very big story expert. and a number of wonderful journalists uh, from the Wall Street Journal and my fiction writers range from a guy named Matthew Quirk, who wrote a great uh, thriller called The 500 a couple of years ago and followed it up with another good one. Um, and, you know, off the top of my head, that's, pr- that's pretty much it. So I've done everything from being an, an editor at the major publishing houses, an independent publisher pre-internet, you know, Kindle ebook. Uh, a literary agent. Oh, I also wrote a book um, with a friend of mine who's the editor-in-chief of ESPN, the magazine, about the the rise of the Pittsburgh Steelers in the 1970s and the simultaneous fall of the steel industry called, uh, <laughs> called The Ones Who Hit the Hardest. So um, I've pretty much covered the all the terrain that you could really think of in book publishing. And I got to tell you, it's, uh, you know, I, I couldn't find a better profession. I just absolutely love what I do. And, and that, that's an amazing background, how you can have, you know, working for in California with all, with, with uh, Endeavor and, you know, and, uh, you know, I, I actually have, you know, um, connections at William Morris. Um, and it's funny because they were just talking today about, uh, they're, they're integrating with somebody else now. And I forget who they, they were mentioning. IMG. But, yes, that's it. <laughs> and, um, they were, they were just saying now it's, it's sort of like a, you know, the whole, the guy with the whole process. Cause obviously some people are going to leave, some people are going to be there anymore. Um, you know, which actually runs into my next question, you know, uh, is there a, a, you know, reason, you know, a, a, well, actually how and why did you start, you know, black Irish books? Oh well, that's um, 
that's a pretty good question. Uh, <laughs> so after I left Endeavor, um, and you know, they were actually really cool about uh, my leaving. It was one of those situations where, where you just described where they they took on you know a, a new agency, and they sort of what they did is they nicely asked people to volunteer to be fired. And uh, so I was at this point in my life where, you know, I, I, I loved working there, but I didn't really like having a boss all that much. So when that opportunity arose, I really jumped on it. So the reason why uh, I started Black Irish Books with Stephen Pressfield was because a, a few years ago, and this is not to denigrate his former publisher, but a few years ago, he, he had finished and completed a really wonderful thriller which was uh, sort of set in the near future called The Profession. And this was a wonderful book about, you know, what the future warfare and, and life would be like if there was a charismatic sort of MacArthur figure who came on the scene. Great book. I mean, Steve and I worked on it um, for, for quite some time. And his publisher at the time was was uh, not so interested in hearing and doing kind of the the kind of things that Steve and I wanted to do to promote the book, which which was to kind of radically give away quite a number of copies. And what we wanted to do was start the conversation about the book within the military communities. And Steve has great connections to um, – you know, to the Marines, to the Army, to the Navy. And so what we went to the publisher and we said, hey, look, why don't we give away 5,000 copies of the profession to guys and, and, and women who are serving in Afghanistan and, and Iraq? And, you know, one of the things about being in combat and being serving in the military is that you're constantly on standby. Um, so you have a lot of time. And what these guys do is they read a lot. Um, so we thought if we could get this book into their hands early and give them an opportunity to read it, they could start a conversation outside of the military community and really get the book sort of talked about before it was even published. Well, unfortunately, the publisher did not want to give away any books. And they said, nah, that's a really nice idea, but you know, we've invested a lot in the book and we don't want to give away any copies. So no, we're not going to do that. So that was a really sort of major turning point for Steve and I because, you know, here here was an effort that we even we even offered to pay for them um, because we believe so strongly in the concept. And again, they said no. So I remember walking out of uh, you know the Random House you know, <laughs> high rise in the middle of Midtown Manhattan. And my head was kind of you know shrunk down and Steve wasn't feeling so great. We went across the street to get a cheeseburger. And I said, look, you know, why don't we just figure out a way to do something ourselves? And what we came up with was, was using the concept of, you know, the military community that we both love and doing something for them, you know, for free. So the very first book that we published was called The Warrior Ethos. And what The Warrior Ethos was, was a way for us to make a connection to the guys who are serving in the military in a way that would really touch them. So Steve is this very devout, deep reader in all things military. Military history, this guy knows so much about it, especially the antiquity. Um, the Greeks, the Spartans, the, the Romans, he knows all of this stuff. So I said, why don't you do a nonfiction book that explains – sort of the traditions and the ethos of what it is to be a, a combat veteran or somebody who has to go to war. So that's the very first book we published, and we ended up giving away uh, something like 23,000 copies because the minute we gave them to, to people in Afghanistan, they were coming back and asking for more. So that concept was so interesting to us that I said, hey, Steve, as a lark, why don't we put it on sale? Let's just throw it on sale, put it up on Amazon and all the other, you know, sort of ebook revenue streams like Kobo and iTunes and, and see if there's enough of a demand for this thing that it can live on its own. And what do you know? You know, the first couple of months we sold 50 copies and then it was 60 copies. Before you knew it, we were doing, you know, 1,500 copies a month. And, and to date we've sold, and it's only been since 2011, we've sold about 60,000 copies of that book.
and it's all wor word of mouth. So anyway, this is a very, very long story to tell you that Black Irish Books sort of came about through a frustration with the major trade publishers and our dedication and our love for, you know, guys and women who serve in the military. That's how it started. <laughs> and, you know, Sean, I, I, I love long stories, uh, <laughs> but, but, you know, that is a very fascinating story. And, you know, it, I think it, it resonates with a lot of people nowadays where they just sort of, you know, I think you hit the nail on the head where they, they want to be their own boss because they don't like having other people be their boss. You know what I mean? Mm hmm. Yeah, it's it's um, there's nothing wrong with a boss, but a lot of bosses, what they do is they just say no. And if you're your own boss, it gives you the freedom to to do things and to try things that you would never get approved of from from a third party. So th that's what I love about it. And, you know, you fail a lot and everything doesn't work out. And there, there are a lot of mistakes that we've made at Black Irish Books. And, you know what, we try and learn from each one and we try and make the mistakes that aren't going to completely wipe us out. But... Um, ones that we can learn from. And even if it doesn't work out the way we want it to, as long as we take it from the point of view of sort of generosity in that if we're going to make a mistake, we're going to be too generous as opposed to too stingy and worrying about people stealing our stuff. You know, I think um, Tim O'Reilly, you know, the, the famous entrepreneur once said that the internet age, you know, the problem is not piracy, it's anonymity. <laughs> and I think he was absolutely right. Yeah, you, you know, um, I, I, as I, you know, look out more on Amazon, you know, and especially in the Kindle, which you brought up, you know, I see more and more people self-publishing their books. And, you know, a lot of, a lot of the times I, I you know, sometimes I'll, I'll purchase a couple uh, you know, here and there from like completely unknown authors, just just to see, you know, who's out there or, and right. also obviously, um, but all Stephen's books, I, I actually have them behind me. You can't see them right now, but I swear they're there. And, uh, you know, I, I buy them all from black Irish, uh, books, um, obviously of the war of art and everything like that. But, um, you know, you know, with the advent of self-publishing, do you ever see a, uh, you know, a decline in quality? Like meaning like, do you, you know, when you're, you know, uh, you know, whether you're on your Kindle or your Nook and you're looking through books, do you ever see, you know, things as an editor that like really irk you uh, at all? Well, um, I, I, what I actually think is that, um, of course there are, there are bad books, you know, bad books. I, I mean, I don't think the quality has gone down. Um, what I do think is that there's a certain percentage of, of terrific storytellers out there. And then there are sort of like the, uh, the workmen, you know, grinders who learn their craft and it takes a few books to kind of get their feet under them. And then once they get more familiar with the terrain of, of the, the place they want to work, the genres that they want to explore, then they get better and they get better and they get better. What, what I think is great is that there is an opportunity for people to, to really work um, and to get feedback. And even if the feedback from the general public isn't so great in the first book, they can learn from that. So you know, back, back in the era when I started, the only way to be published was to be picked by, um, an agent, right? Mm -hmm. An agent, you would solicit a bunch of agents and they would go through your stuff and they would say, yeah, uh, I'd like to represent you. And then they would submit it to the 15 or 20 publishing houses. And if you, you made that cut, then you would get, you know, in, into a list and at a publisher. And so, that was the only way it, it ever worked. And, and, and the problem with that was that there were a lot of terrific writers who just could never navigate that, that very difficult process, that business process that can kind of suck the soul out of you. you know. So I think the fact that there's opportunities now for people to, to self-publish it's great. And I'll tell you what, a lot of the major bestsellers that, that sort of come out now, it turns out that these were self-published writers before they, they hit 
with the major publishers. Um, you know, famously, there's the the, the Fifty Shades of Grey phenomenon, and then um, I believe the there's a terrific book that I just started reading called The Martian, which I don't even like science fiction generally, but it's it's a lot of fun. And I think that was a self-published title too. I think Alex Weir is the the author of that. Um, so I think I think what you're finding here is that before there was never a triple A system. You know, to throw a baseball analogy, at it, there was no double A. There was no you know local baseball team. And now with the internet and the Kindle stuff, there's an opportunity that if you can tell a really great story and you can get you know a critical mass of people to agree with you. You could have a career, and you don't necessarily even have to go to a major publisher anymore. In fact, the economics probably are are much better um, going at self publishing route than it, than going with the major publisher, unless you really just want to be published by Random House and tell your mom that. You know, that's <laughs> there's nothing wrong with that. You know, I was published by Penguin, and I told everybody I was, and it was great. Um, but you know, if I had to do it all over again, for instance, I, I will be publishing the book, uh, the story grid at black Irish books with Steve, because, um, we'll be able to do a lot more marketing and fun stuff, giving things away and promoting it and doing things that a major publisher would just never even consider. It, you know, uh, that's a good point you brought up as the marketing. Uh, cause you know, I, when I find when people self publish, I, you know, I, I I have friends who self publish books, and a lot of the times that's the, the the point where they just kind of throw up their hands and go, "What next?" You know what I mean? Like, how am I supposed right. to market this? Uh, and most people, uh, I think, you know, they go on their Facebook and they'll say, "Hey, everybody, I published a book. Here it is." But you know, I, I think you know people are starting to le- learn there's a lot more involved with a book launch, as you know, I- even with like the, if we launched a movie, there's always a build up to the release date. There's our email list that we have to procure, uh, you know, things like that, right? Am I right, Sean? Oh, absolutely. Um, but but again, I think the opportunities today are are available, and it, um, you know, generally speaking, the way to market a book is not to tell your friends, oh, I just finished my book and you can go buy it. You know, that's not really – if somebody told me that, I'd be like, why would I want to buy your book? You know, <laughs> I, I know <laughs> – you know, you're you're not that interesting. I can't imagine that you would write an interesting book. But um, but the way to to market is really about writing more, reading more, thinking thinking about how you can be of, uh, of service to other people. So, for for example, um, you know, we, the way we sort of got in contact was through my website, thestorygrid.com. Now, I started that in September. Um, to write about what what my what my life's work is, right? Mm-hmm. It's not just to sell a book. It's to um, present the information that I've learned over tw- 25 years in the book publishing industry as an editor to, to tell people what I've learned, what fundamentals of storytelling I have learned and how I have created and think about how I do my job. Now, in the olden days, and this is only like, what, seven years ago? In the olden days, um, you would have these great editors or these great painters or musicians or, you know, people who build houses or carpenters or electricians. And th- when they would die, all of, the, all of the stuff that they had learned over their lives would die with them. Now, today we have the opportunity where, you know, if I get hit by a truck tomorrow, knock on wood that that doesn't happen, at least there's going to be some of the stuff that I know available for people in the future. Now, does everybody really care about how to edit a story? No, of course not. But, but there are people who really love storytelling and who would like to be better storytellers, right? Mm-hmm. So the reason why I do the blog stuff is not necessarily to sell my book, although I'd love to sell a ton of copies, don't get me wrong, but it's to give away the information that I have learned over 25 years, something that I had to learn myself um, by reading and thinking and working and you know editing 
probably, I mean, hundreds of books and all practically every kind of genre that you could imagine, nonfiction and fiction included. So when people say, how do I market my book? I think what they need to think about is what is it that they have that other people don't have that would want? So if you're, say, you're writing a nonfiction book about how you built your house, the, the tools and techniques that you would have acquired to do that kind of great Im- imaginative thing are that's information that people would want to have. So the way you market your book is by giving away your intellectual capital in a way that's entertaining, you know? So market, it takes a long time, you know, a, a friend of mine and I'm, I'm, he's a, I'm lucky to have him is a guy named Seth Godin. And Seth, you know, he's he's on his 5,783rd post. The guy posts every day. He blogs every day, and he's been doing it for over 10 years. And every day he comes up with something that just rocks my world. I read it every morning, and I'm like, wow, that's, that's something I hadn't considered. And that's going to make me get out of bed a, with a little bit more of a spring in my step. And so what he does, he's, he's not doing it to sell books. He doesn't, you don't buy the blog. You get it for free. Um, so my advice for people who are like, I don't know how to sell my book. I don't know how to market. Well, why were you put on earth? What have you done with your life? What is interesting about you? Tell me about that. Don't tell me about, you know, the the deal you're going to offer on your ebook. I don't care about that. (laughs) I care about why you think you should be on earth breathing air and what you've done in your life, that's interesting. So that's my big takeaway for marketing. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 you know, Seth Godin is I, – I, I subscribe to his uh, blog every day. So I get the email. Uh, I get it right, sent right to my email. And, um, you know, his book Tribes is mm-hmm. phenomenal. And yeah. I always – you know, uh, urge people when they're always talking about marketing, I say, you know, uh, have you read Seth Godin's tribes? And usually the answer is no. And I'm like, well, go buy it right now. And, you know, about, you know, finding your audience and everything that, that is basically, that is what that book is all about. Yeah. And he came up with the concept of permission marketing, which was a complete revolutionary idea. And he wrote that book, I don't know, 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And that book is the basis of billions of dollars of economic activity today because it's about not hoodwinking your customer. It's about being honest with somebody and saying, hey, I've got something that might be interesting to you. Would you like to hear about it? If you do, then I'll send you some information every every now and then. Mm -hmm. And it's that simple concept where you're, you're dealing with somebody as a human being, not as a potential dollar sign that has really, really inspired me to, to do what I do. Because I, I used to think about you know, business and book selling and being a publisher as, how do I manipulate people to the point where they'll part with $20? You know? <laughs> and that, you know, that's kind of a, that's a very adolescent and amateur way of looking at the world. And through, through people like Seth and Steve, uh, who's a good friend and a great mentor too, I mean, uh, I, I've learned that people are m- much more receptive if you're saying, hey, this is interesting to me. Is, is this interesting to you? Um, what do you think? And so you, you make a connection and you, you take it from there as opposed to how am I going to acquire this customer and suck $127 out of them per year? You know? <laughs> Uh, you know, you mentioned uh, your, you know, the story grade, which is your life's work. You know, could you take us into that? You know, um, one how, how you actually came about creating the story grid, and you can. And for those that don't know, could you actually explain? You know, what what the purpose is? Sure. Well, I started sort of piecing this idea together. You know, twenty years ago, when I started as an assistant editor at Dell Publishing. And I had the great fortune of being able to work with an editor who at the time was editing Elmore Leonard, right? Mm -hmm. 
And you know, I'm sure you know <laughs> how amazing Elmore Leonard is. I have a lot of his books right behind me. Again, you can't, oh, yeah. you can't see it, Sean, but I swear it's there. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, had, I was an assistant editor, and I was working with Jackie Farber, who was his editor at the time. And we edited – she would give me his, his first draft, which was just gold. You know, she, she gave me the first draft of Rum Punch, which turned into Jackie Brown, the Tarantino movie. Mm -hmm. And she also gave me Pronto, which turned into um, – you know, the Raylan Givens Justified series on TNT. Mm -hmm. So um, that's how I started really saying to myself, wow, here is a master storyteller who it seems just completely effortless. And when you read Elmore Leonard, it's like it's like you're listening to his story. He's such a great writer. So um, so from those beginnings, I said to myself, there's got to be a real foundation a real a real thing behind storytelling that nobody is telling me because editors would just say oh well you know i i write down a list of the characters and what they do and then i try and figure out you know if it makes sense and it so editing there's no there's no school to go to learn how to be an editor there's no um you know, the apprenticeship is great, and I learned a lot from the editors that I worked for before I became my own editor. But when I became my own editor and I was acquiring books and I, I was doing it all myself, I felt like a fraud. I felt like I was sort of like giving gut reactions to stories and not really speaking in a, in a, a language that the writer and I could both share. Like if you're if you're a car mechanic, right? You know what a carburetor is and a drive shaft is. And if you have a discussion with another car mechanic, the two of you can talk about what's wrong with the car, right? You know, well, the carburetor is on the fritz. So I, I'm not a car mechanic. I'm making it up. But do you know what I'm saying? If you have a shared language and a, and a shared sensibility of what makes a car work, then you can really have fun. Then you can really get into the details of the electrical systems, the air conditioning systems, all of that stuff. So I thought to myself, there's got to be this manual, right? There's got to be this manual about how to edit a story, how to edit a long-form story. So uh, I tried to find it. And what I found was Robert McKee and Story which is an amazing book and I'm sure you, you I'm sure that's right behind you too Dave but yeah it's, um, it's right next to the war of art <laughs> so so I read story and I'm like oh my god this is the keys to the kingdom and I went to Bob's seminars and eventually I became his agent you know like a decade later because I became such a uh, fanboy and I'm like these principles are amazing and they're perfect and they make complete sense how can i make those principles practical how can i say to a writer okay your inciting incident in act three is doesn't have the oomph that your inciting incident in act two had you know how can i how can i teach them how to lay out a book in a way that we can both use so this is how the story grid kind of began and over the past 20 years I've, I've discovered that there are basically two ways of, of editing. There's the big global point of view, which is like the view from 30,000 feet where you say, oh, the beginning of the movie was great. The middle was a little flaky, but then the end really paid off extremely well. So um, what I've created from that is, uh, is sort of a, a one, one page, what, what I call the fool's cap, you know, one page method. And I get that from my friend, Steve Pressfield. And so that sort of gives you a full outline of the entire story on one page. And so along with that, and then I break down scene by scene from the beginning of a story until the end. So, for example, on the website, I'm working on The Silence of the Lambs, and I'll be walking through, you know, readers of how Thomas Harris, you know, put together The Silence of the Lambs, the, the novel, not, not the screenplay. But they're remarkably similar. I mean, that's why, you know, uh, I think it was Jonathan Demme. He did an amazing job because he, he basically shot the book when he made that movie. It, it, it's really that tight. So, you know, The Silence of the Lambs has 64 scenes in it. So for each scene, 
there's a whole bunch of criteria that I've analyzed to show the movement of the scene from you know the beginning of the scene to the end of the scene and then the scene after that. And so if you go to the storygrid.com, you can see what eventually I've created, which is basically just a big infographic showing how the movements and the storytelling work in The Silence of the Lambs. So um, it's a very, I mean, it, it's not... It's not the kind of thing I can describe in a really quick two-second two soundbite. But, but essentially, it's, it's a way of looking at um, global storytelling and line-by-line -line storytelling on one beautiful piece of paper so that if you ever get stuck, you can say, oh, right, well, I didn't really – so when I'm explaining to a writer why their book needs a little work, I can show them – a story grid and say, look, as you can see, you've dipped here when you should have, you know, risen. So um, over the next, you know, few months, we'll get more and more deep, deeply into it. But if you're a story nerd like me, uh, you know, I can go on for hours about this stuff. Um, and over the last couple of months, what I've been covering is are the particular genres, because you really need to have a a sensibility of, of what genre you want to work in before you can really dive into the nuts and bolts of creating, you know, that one page story outline. And then what I call the story grid spreadsheet, which is the scene by scene evolution of, of a global story. And is that because, you know, each genre has, you know, its own, you know, tropes and everything that, that audiences exactly. come to expect? Exactly. Um, Every every particular genre has its own uh, conventions and obligatory scenes. For you know, for example, if you went to see a, a horror movie, you're going to expect a scene where you know the victim's at the mercy of the monster, right? You know, that's that's like the climactic moment of the of the horror movie is when you know the monster is on top of the victim and about to eat them or slaughter them or whatever. <laughs> And and seeing whether or not that victim is able to to outsmart that monster and get away, you know that's why people go to see horror movies. So if you don't have that scene, uh, you don't have a horror story. You know what I mean? And a lot of people, believe it or not, a lot of people don't put that in. Mm -hmm. So it's like a very easy thing to say to somebody: Hey, your crime story is terrific, but you don't have a body. Nobody's dead in your crime story. So if this is a murder mystery, you got to have a body. I mean, it's sometimes it's as simple as that. So you know, as you, you know, see a lot of stuff with uh, from from an editing perspective, you know, you use a story grid, grid correct to you know go through each story and say, hey, listen, you don't have this, or this scene is too similar to something we've already seen before. Is am I correct in that? Yes, um, I really. The the in depth story grid work that I I've, I've done I do maybe two projects a year, where um, you know, where I will go soup to nuts with the writer and work with them for anywhere from two to four months, going through a particular draft, m multiple drafts many times. So that's a very intense. Um, amount of work. Um, so generally I only do like maybe one or two of those per year. And they're usually a situation where I'm called in by a major publisher to, to help them out of a jam. You know? uh, so I don't really solicit new clients for my, for my literary agency because I am focused on my own writing and on the black Irish books publishing side. But, um, you know, as I was, as this system was evolving, you know, this is, this is the, the work from, you know, editing 300 books and figuring out what worked and what didn't work and what helped people and what didn't help people. So, um, every time I've, I've walked a writer through the system, they love it because it, it tells them what their problems are, not that they're the problem, but what the problems are. Because a lot of writers, you know, if something is, is bothering me and they don't quite know what they think it's their fault. Right. They think, Oh, I'm a terrible writer. I just, oh, I just can't break this. It's just driving me crazy. 
And the reality is, is that if you can identify that one scene or even that one beat in a scene, that's the problem, then they're so excited because then they, they can just turn their mind to fixing it and they don't have to self-flagellate, you know? And that's the great thing about editing, ed, being an editor is that to help a writer find out the problems and to help them come up with solutions, there's, there's nothing more exciting and fun. And, and you know, I've, I've been there too and I think a lot of other writers have been there before where – you just get so frustrated at, at you know a certain point in the story, or you just sort of push it away and say that's it, I'm terrible, or you know like like in Stephen <laughs> like in Stephen's book, The Art of War, he says you know resistance. That's another form of resistance coming through, where it's like let's just give up and this is never going to go anywhere. Let's just pack it in, and right. uh, you know I think a tool like this would be very beneficial. Um, well, it will, and and the other thing that's fun, Dave, is is for me what I plan on doing is, you know taking some of the great the great you know archetypes of particular genres and doing story grids for each one of them so for example the thriller i think you can't really do much better than the silence of the lambs um you know breaking it down scene by scene and showing exactly how thomas harris put together that ferrari you know it's literally like put it, pulling apart a car and showing all the moving parts and all the really difficult decisions and brilliant decisions that he made to keep the reader guessing and turning pages. Um, and so what I plan on doing is doing similar things for, you know, the love story, for the horror novel. I mean, Stephen King's Misery, that's a great story. Um, even The Shining or Carrie, to, to pick that apart and to show the fledgling horror story writer how Stephen King you know, cracked that, you know, the back of those stories and really put together something remarkable. Um, so I plan on doing this. And so eventually, you know, one of the, one of the most important things to do uh, when you're a writer is to read, right? Mm -hmm. So if you can find those archetypical, those best, those pantheon novels that you always loved and you're able to break it down and look at a story grid and see exactly how they solve the problems that you're going to face. Like, how exactly did Thomas Harris solve the, the, the hero at the mercy of the victim scene? Um, well, if you watch the final, you know, 20 minutes of that movie, you'll see what he did. And it's incredible. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I'm sure ever, a lot of your listeners have either seen the movie or, or, or read the book, but it's, you know, it's putting the hero blind into a basement and, and the villain has on, you know, um, what are they calling it? Night vision goggles? Night vision goggles. So the villain's just toying with Starling. And, you know, if Thomas Harris didn't set up the answer to her figuring out where the guy was, in the first third of the book, it wouldn't have worked. But brilliantly, at one of the first meetings that Starling has with Hannibal Lecter, he says to her, do you know what a schizophrenic smells like? And she says, no, it smells like goat. It smells like a goat. And so in the novel, when she is in the complete dark and she hears the snick of... Uh, James Gum Buffalo Bill starting to pull back on the on the chamber of his gun. She smells goat, and it's through that sensory understanding that she's able to move and freeze and shoot him before she, he shoots her. And it's brilliant because he sets it up, you know, 150 pages before that climactic moment. If he didn't make that setup, you would have been like, "How is she going to know where that guy is, really?" Mm -hmm. So, like, those are the little setups and payoffs that are so wonderful when you're an editor or a writer to see and say, oh, my gosh, I know how to do that. Because look what Thomas Harris did. I'm going to have to set up my, my climactic moment in Act 1, and then when it really pays off, then I'm really going to, you know, frighten the, the reader or the viewer. So, you know, Sean, you, you uh, talk a lot about um – uh, you know uh, the movies, uh, the movie adaptations. You know, w would you know your story grid? Would that work the same for screenwriters? Meaning, like, if I created a screenplay without being an adaptation, uh, would it would it still work the same? Absolutely, absolutely. It's exactly the same concept. the The long form story in in a screenplay, or even short form in a short story or a short film, 
you know, what what you'll eventually do in the story grid is to break down each scene into the the least common, the least number of words possible. So, for example, the first scene in The Silence of the Lambs is Clarice Starling gets called into the office of Jack Crawford, who's the head of the of the behavioral science unit at the FBI. And he asks her to interview Hannibal Lecter. So that first scene, you can break down to three words. Starling gets a job, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're going to do a screenplay, you're just – what you're doing is you're working in imagery in a screenplay and not words. So – you know, to be able to describe each of the 64 scenes in Silence of the Lambs, you're going to have 60 – I think there's probably about 60 setups in in the film, too. Um, it was probably 125 to 130 page screenplay because it just if you pull out all of the all of the exposition and the text, you can boil down all the scenes into their, you know, their active moments. So to analyze uh, a screenplay like um you know, even Lost in Translation or any screenplay, you can do the exact same thing to see the the shifts of, you know, the the external values that are at stake. Um, I'm getting a little technical, but uh, the, the short answer is you can absolutely use it for a screenplay. Uh, and that, that's amazing. And, and Sean, please feel free to get as technical as you want to. Uh, <laughs> b- b- believe me, uh, you know, uh, I, I love I love talk like this. And, um, you know, like like you said, we go on for hours and hours about this. Stuff. <laughs> so, uh, you know, Sean, uh, you know, beyond you know the story grid, is there anything else that, you know, you're working on right now with, with whether it be, you know, personally or with black Irish books that you can talk about? Um. Actually, I'm I'm really at the the final fumes of putting together all the art for the book. Um, we think the book will be ready, you know, sometime around February or March of next year, and it's going to have it'll be an oversized trade paperback, so that um, you'll be able to see all the the graphs and the infographics that I'm talking about. So right now, I'm really hammering home on on making sure that it's as clear and concise and easy to understand as possible. Um, so that's my primary thing. In in the offing, you know, Steve and I are working on uh, a new book from him that we're going to be bringing out. I don't really can't really talk too much about it because it's in its early stages. But um, and then in terms of my literary agency, um, it's it's a good time because. You know, I have 15 clients and they're all, you know, under contract and doing their work. So I don't have to bother with them right now. (laughs) You don't have to call back. Where's that buck? It was due two weeks ago. Exactly. (laughs) I don't do that anyway. The way I look at it, when somebody's ready, it's ready. You know? Yeah, that's very true. Uh, 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 Sean, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, Does Robert McKee have a book coming out soon? A new book? Uh, actually I am working with Bob on, uh, a project that is very, very close. We're in our second edit now. Mm -hmm. Um, Bob and I, um, are working on a series of books on, uh, genre. Um, and he's also working on something on dialogue, which I think a lot of your listeners would be really into. Yes, that, that's what I was thinking about the book on dialogue. Yeah, yeah, we're um, we're very close to locking it in, and um, so Bob and I have to talk about the strategies about how to how to best publish it. So uh, I, there's a lot of a lot of the major publishers would love to look work with Bob, but I also think he could, he could do it himself in his own publishing enterprise. So we'll see what he wants to do. He's he's uh, you know. I I see it as one of my missions in life is to get everything out of Bob's head that I can because, um, you know, I I consider myself a pretty, pretty astute student of story. And every time I talk to Bob, it's like talking to, you know, Merlin or something. I mean, the guy (laughs) – the guy can talk. He he knows so much, and he's so he's he's even more into it than I am. 
And so it's like, it's so much fun to talk to him about stories. And the, it's not only that, it's like how important they are. Because I think a lot of people see storytelling as like, oh, yeah, he told me this funny story and it was really neat. The reality is we as human beings, the only way we're capable of dealing with the chaos of our world is through storytelling. And so to, to know how to tell a story, it's a crucial skill set that's only going to be more and more important as, as the years go on. So um, Bob's knowledge is just so comprehensive. Um, and he's introduced me to other people who, who are as excited about story as I am. And, uh, you know, one of his colleagues is a foremost expert on action stories, which, um, you know, that, that's what's running Hollywood right now, or all the superhero action stories and all that stuff. And mm -hmm. his name is uh, Basim El Wakil, and we're working with him on, on doing a book on action, which I think would be great. So lot, lots of stuff to come from Bob, and I'm pressing him as quickly as I can, but he's a perfectionist, and thank God he is because his stuff is great. Yeah, and you know, uh, uh, Bob is the last one of the big three because uh, you know there was um, Sid Field, then there was you know Blake Snyder, and then there was McKee, and you know um, Sid and Blake have, have you know, passed away, and you know whenever yeah. whenever I'm in a, uh, you know I, I talk to you out in Hollywood or you know uh, or meet you know any type of story consultant, they they know of the big three. And they usually, you know, either somebody will say, hey, you know, what's your save the cat beat sheet or something like that. But, you know, but McKee, you know, everyone goes back to him because everyone goes back to story. You know, everyone goes back to this is the foundation where everyone's coming from. Well, I was lucky enough when I was at Dell. I worked with Sid for um, four screenplays, I think it was. Um, great, wonderful guy. Sid Field was just a really charming really great guy and his uh his concept you know his i think he's takes it from i think aristotle um you know the the three act structure um i use to i don't really i don't really um care so much about how many acts you have in that um you know some some people have five acts seven acts whatever what's important to me when I look at stories, the beginning hook, the middle build, and the ending payoff. And that's basically what I took from Sid. You know, it's to look at your global story in three major chunks. And I, I'm, I do a lot of stuff in the book on, in the story grid about where did those chunks come from. And if you break it down, if you look at the math, I also have like a, a science background. When I went to college, I, I majored in bio, uh, microbiology and I did a lot of work in biochemistry and so I'm all about you know is there some formula I can boil it down to and it's not formula but basically what it boils down to is storytelling structure is basically 25% of the beginning of the story is your hook right it's mm -hmm. how you grab the reader it's the inciting incident and then you got 50% is your sort of your middle build, which you progressively complicate the story to the point where it's excruciating, right? And then <laughs> the final, you know, 25% or 15, and I'm, you know, these are generalities. They're not, you know, you don't have to, it doesn't have to be perfectly 25%. That's your ending payoff, right? So the promise you make at the beginning hook of your story, you've got to pay off at the end. And as David Mamet always says, you know, the ending has to be surprising but inevitable, right? You have to, reflecting back when you think of the beginning of the story, you go, oh, my gosh, how didn't I see this coming? But mm -hmm. it's so surprising that it, it rocks your world and you create catharsis. So, you know, looking at – so just to get back to Sid for a moment, I really – that deeply implanted in my head that the three – you know, the three major pillars of your story. Um, and so I, I look at it, I look at long form and any kind of story in those, in those terms, the beginning hook, your middle build and your ending payoff. And you just use that as a mantra and make sure that your beginning hook is always paid off by the end in a surprising and in inevitable way. And one of the ways to do that is, is, is to use, and to know genre to to a degree that will will just make your life so much easier 
Um, anyway, so Sid and Bob, you know, I'm lucky enough to have to have worked with both of them. I, I didn't work with Blake, but you know, every everybody I've ever talked to always say, "Hey, have you read Save the Cat?" And I, I haven't, but um, I'm sure it's extremely valuable. Yeah, you know that, that's a great saying by Mamet. By the way, I, I'm, I'm going to write that down. It, it, it's that, that that is so great to keep in mind. And um, you know, Mamet, I actually downloaded um, one of his uh, audio books. Um, it's, it's 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 a play though. It, it's it's uh, Speed the Plow, but it, oh, it's yeah. you know it's uh, it's obviously it's a uh, reenactment through actors. You know, but it, it, it's a uh, I, I've heard amazing things about it, and I have his one book, um, Bambi vs. Godzilla. Love that book. Love that. <laughs> and uh, there's another book I have of his, and I, I can't remember. I think it's on – it's not on film, is it? Yeah, it's on film. And um, I, that is another book where – You can't go wrong with him. He, yeah. He, he, um, he's written – Three Uses for the Knife is a great book, True and False. Um, of course, Bambi vs. Godzilla. He's just his his essays are just so entertaining. You can't help but laugh out loud. And he's uh, he's a he's a wonderful guy. He's so smart. It's really intimidating. Like every time I talk to him, I feel like I'm saying something stupid. <laughs> <laughs> and he lets me know when I am too. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Sean, um, this has been an awesome interview. Um, I know you're busy and I, you know, uh, I've taken up enough of your time. Is there anything that we haven't talked about, um, you know, that, that you wanted to maybe mention, you know, or do you have a final thought? Um, the, the only thing that I would, you, you had mentioned to me earlier, uh, last time we were talking about, you know, is there, what do I look for if I'm ever going to consider bringing on a client? Mm-hmm. And, you know, the one thing I would say is I want a professional. And what a professional means is somebody who's done their research, who knows the terrain that they're working in and is an adult, right, who's not going to freak out if I say, you know what, this isn't quite for me. Um, So that's really, you know, becoming a professional writer requires a lot of hard work. And if there's one thing I could say It's like if you're a writer, you know you're a writer because you just are miserable unless you do it at least an hour a day. Um, And what I'm trying to do with the story grid is to make the work less esoteric and more practical, to really give instructions on how to become a better writer every single day that are real practical things to do as opposed to take some time and think about the clouds and write about how birds move. You know, that, that stuff does not help you if you're trying to solve a, a middle build problem, you know, where everybody's going to sleep the minute they get to page 200 in your book. Um, so hard work is, you know, it's a reward in itself. And if you're, if you're a writer, you know, just keep at it. And um, that's it. You made a very good point. Uh, if you don't enjoy the work, or, or sorry, if you don't enjoy the journey, uh, you won't enjoy you won't enjoy anything. It, it, you know, I, I, somebody once said that to me. Uh, I may have gotten that from Stephen Pressfield's "Do the Work," but but, <laughs> but, uh, but you know I, that's something I've learned. And it, it's so true because if you don't enjoy doing this, you're not going to enjoy the next one or the third one or the fourth one. And, you know, you have to sort of, you know, make the work meaningful because uh, I don't know where I've heard this one from, but the only thing hard work gets you is more work. Mm-hmm. So- <laughs> well, it's, it's the famous thing that Steve always quotes from the Bhagavad Vita, which is that, you know, everybody has the right to their work, but they don't have right to the fruits of the labor. Mm-hmm. So um, it's a hard concept to come up when you, when you finish something and you're like, where's my payday? And there's no payday. You have the right to do the work, and that's what you need to really focus on. And the other stuff is going to take care of itself. You just keep doing the work, and if you get a little bit better each day, that's that's all you can do. And it's not easy for anybody. That's true. I mean, to, to, it's hard for David Mamet to sit in a chair every day. It really is. He doesn't want. He wants to go fly his airplane. He wants to go do something <laughs> else. But the guy sits down in his chair every day and he writes at least five hundred words, whether they're worthless or not, makes little difference to him. 
but he has to do it. Same thing with Steve. Same thing with me. I mean, I'm not near their level of expertise, but that's just the thing. It's like a habit. You know, it's like brushing your teeth. You got to do it. <laughs> that that that's amazing advice. Um, and uh, you know, uh, uh, Sean, where can people find you at on the uh, online? Uh, just www.storygrid.com. And um, I'm not really good with Facebook and Twitter and all that stuff, so that's the best place to reach me. And it's it's a very down and dirty site that you'll either fall in love with or you'll say, "This is ridiculous. This is the rantings of a madman." <laughs> <laughs> Well, after this interview, I think most people are going to say, this guy knows what he's talking about. We should definitely read more. <laughs> My site is, is is ravings of a madman, believe me. Uh, no, no, no. I, I checked it out. It looks great. Oh, thank you. Uh, it, it, to, to get all those little buttons on everything, to make them all perfect. and to, Oh, I know. It, it, I gave up. Yeah, it, it took a lot, and I'm actually redesigning my site right now because I don't like the way it looks anymore. I'm now like, – I'm a perfectionist too. And I'm always like, ah, well, this looks like garbage. I got to redo this. Uh, but everyone, thanks again for listening. Um, you can find me at DaveBullis.com. Twitter, it's at Dave underscore Bullis. And Sean, thank you so much for coming on. Not at all, Dave. Happy to do it. And uh, when your book comes out, please let me know, and uh, I'll make sure to have you back on. Oh, that'd be fun. That'd be great. Excellent. Uh, so, Sean, this, uh, please you know, have a great night, and um, if you need anything, please feel free to call. Okay. Take it easy, Dave. Take it easy. Bye. Bye-bye. Find Dave at DaveBullis.com. Please make sure to subscribe and share the podcast.